Uh, our session number three today is on the subject of energy poverty. And the session will consider the economic and ethical ramifications of uh, rising energy prices on lower and middle income families. This is uh, not necessarily a religious issue, but I am reminded myself as a religious person of Matthew 25, 40, which says, truly I say to you, to the extent that you did it to one of these brothers and sisters of mine, even the least of them, you did it to me. That's what I keep in mind when I think of what uh, energy poverty uh, brings um, to the world. I will say that the very next verse in Matthew says, then he will also say to those on his left, depart from me, accursed ones. But I didn't, I didn't want to make a political statement, so <laughs> I thought I shouldn't say that. Um, we have three excellent speakers today, and obviously their bios are in your program, and I will be introducing each one first and then uh, let them speak. Our first speaker is Dr. Caleb Rossiter. He's a professor at American University in both the School of International Affairs and the Department of Mathematics and Statistics. His interest in claims of fossil fuel of, of climate catastrophe arose from teaching courses in both African politics and global climate models. In 2014, he was terminated as a fellow at the Institute of Policy Studies. Didn't know if you wanted me to say this, oh, but he was terminated I'm looking for, work. <laughs> for publishing an article in the Wall Street Journal that critiqued climate models and called for an end to international restrictions on African generation, on, on African generation of electricity. Dr. Rossiter received his PhD in policy analysis from uh, Cornell University. He's published a number of books on foreign policy, including his most recent, The Turkey and the Eagle, The Struggle for America's Glo Global Role. Please welcome Dr. Rossiter. Well, I'm so glad to be here, rock and roll, okay. Um, I thought when I saw the program this morning that um, I had a lot in common with a politician you may remember. Do you remember when Ross Perot ran for president? Who can remember who his vice presidential nominee was? Admiral, Admiral James Stockdale. Yes. Now, Admiral Stockdale and I don't really have a lot in common. Uh, he served in the Vietnam War. I was an anti-war protester. Uh, he would be vice president for Ross Perot, and I, I turned Ross down. <laughs> but he said something great in a debate uh, of vice presidential candidates. He was there on stage with the candidates for the other the Democrat and Republican, and they turned to Mr. Stockdale, Admiral Stockdale, and he said famously, what am I doing here? <laughs> and that's what I felt this morning when I saw that I was on a panel following Will Happer and Richard Lindzen. These are two of the greatest names in American physics, and I'm a statistics professor <laughs> from American University. Uh, but then I realized at lunch why I was here, because the room uh, had been dedicated and a lot of it paid for by the founder of Clear Channel Radio. Now, Clear Channel Radio is known to me only as the group that took the Dixie Chicks off the air because they criticized George Bush, and I'm a big Dixie Chicks fan. So I think I'm here to provide a little bipartisan relief. Um, I'm a lifelong Democrat. I ran for Congress as a Democrat. I served Democratic members of Congress on their foreign policy staff. And uh, unfortunately for me, this is one issue where I am uh, sort of ostracized from the Democratic Party. And I will explain a bit of why that is. What do I touch to move this thing? Thank you. Now, I'm going to talk about Africa and energy and poverty. There are two dilemmas I want you to focus on that Africa is facing. One is a dilemma relating to electricity, its generation and transmission. One's a dilemma relating to the foreign exchange that they need to fund their development. So let me move and see if this is correct. Okay, African electricity. Here is the dilemma. 
Everybody who works in Africa, and I've spent a lot of time working in Africa in my career, realizes that with 25% you know, of Africans having access to electricity, we need a lot more power generated in Africa if we're going to raise life expectancy and produce c clean water. Um, however, the very people who are, could fund it, the World Bank, the European Union, United States government, are trapped in their global climate alarmist fears. They won't produce it out of coal. They say to Africa, we want to help you generate power and let's build some windmills. <laughs> Unfortunately, that's a nice idea, but at the moment Africa has a lot of coal uh, and a lot of need for electricity. So the result has been in the last five years, there's been virtually no new power generation added in Africa or transmission uh, by the World Bank in the U.S. in their uh, Power Africa initiative. If you could see the average African cooking their dinner, studying at night for school, you would see them doing it without electricity. Only one of four homes has electricity in Africa. Terrible health effects, of course, that helps reduce life expectancy in Africa when you're burning animal dung or wood in your house. Um, kerosene and diesel. Now factories and businesses, I was saying to a friend at lunch who I met here today, if this was in Lagos, Nigeria, the lights would have gone out four times already during lunch. Blackouts and brownouts are typical even in the most power-laden African country. And so that's resulted in something terrible called the dieselization of African manufacturing. Anything Africa produces that could be produced at a cost, making it competitive in the world market, is only produced because when the lights go off, when the power goes down, and this is from South Africa all the way to Egypt, boom, on come the generators, the diesel generators out back. Massive diesel uh, backup generators have to burn immediately or else your manufacturing line goes down. What's the result? I don't know if you've ever been near a large diesel generator when it's on. It's spewing so much uh, pollution, real pollution, <laughs> into the air uh, that it's a terrible health risk. It's also very inefficient, uses much more energy than if you were getting a reliable supply of electricity from a coal-fired plant. <laughs> Never expect power always is the acronym for NEPA, which is Nigeria's uh, energy agency. This is a tremendously resource-rich country, Nigeria. One of four Africans is a Nigerian. Tremendous work ethic, tremendously powerful um, social and national groups there. And yet, these are market people um, doing their work by candlelight as if it was 500 years ago. Now, the grid. This is where I part company with many of my colleagues uh, on America's political left who want to help Africa develop energy. They always say, let's let Africa skip this whole thing about having a giant power grid that transmits energy along high, high, high energy wires. Let's try something different. And you know, you couldn't make this stuff up. Some of the things US government funds relies on girls urinating into the generator to create an electrical connection that will spur a little bit of energy so you can study at night. Boys walking their cows around a generator like in the old days in Holland to make the, uh, uh, the, 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 the turbine tur and children kicking soccer balls around that they can quick rush into their house with that will generate a little bit of light in the soccer ball through a little battery and they can do their homework at night. These are not solutions, okay? We need a modern grid in Africa or else they can't compete and they can't raise their life expectancy and they can't join the world, period. Uh, Africa generates only as much uh, power as uh, Spain with, of course, 20 times more people. Um, they don't have any transmission really across borders, which is what you need for a continent with 53 sovereign nations. Nobody can do their own grid, really. Um, and you need lots of new power. Even South Africa needs more power in their load shedding and hurting their tremendous manufacturing se um, sector because people don't want to invest in a country where it goes brown Mondays, Tuesdays, and Thursdays to make sure that you have the other days free. That's called load shedding when you try to save your industry. Here's a picture of the US grid. Every state in the country has a power grid at high transmission levels, which then can be taken offline to the other small towns. Everybody's on the grid in America. This is why the power is there when you turn on the light, when you turn on the switch for your factory. 
Now keep that picture in mind for a second. This is Africa's grid. And, and the blue is what's Africa. All those red lines you see up there are just proposals that have not been funded. So you literally have an entire continent without a grid. And you wonder why industry can't compete coming from Africa. You need a grid if you're going to have consistent um, production and therefore good investment. Now, there is a solution, obviously, and it should be done immediately. Whatever your position on uh, catastrophic climate models, or I guess Professor Lindzen's corrected us, the models aren't catastrophic. The predictions based on the models are catastrophic. Um, we need to help Africa generate its power. It's a moral imperative. Uh, we should be helping them create cleaner power. And that means, and no insult to my friends on the left who say there's no such thing as a clean coal plant. There are cleaner coal plants, and we're talking about the real poisons, the nitrous oxides, uh, the sulfur dioxide that comes out of plants if you don't scrub them, if you don't do catalytic conversion. You need to spend a little of your power taking the dirt out. Now, most people don't want to do that, like in China, because they don't want to use the power for the cleaning. It's a pretty big hunk. It's like 20 to 30 percent of your power goes to the conversion, but we need to do that. And yet we won't fund that in Africa. We veto it when the World Bank tries to do it, um, because it creates carbon dioxide. To me, that the moral, that there's a there's more moral case for that. Uh, real life expectancy now, Africa needs to move past 55 years life expectancy to the 75 that China has come to enjoy, uh, let alone the 80 we've come to enjoy, uh, is more important than potential disaster ever from now. Okay. Now, the second problem I want to talk about uh, may not be such a happy topic for some people in this room. Africa needs foreign exchange uh, to import the equipment and expertise to do the transmission lines. You can't just put a uh, a modern transmission line in an African country and expect it to be working three weeks from now. Constant spare parts, constant maintenance, constant expertise. Otherwise, you have the so-called white elephant problem, these projects that are scattered all over Africa by foreign aid agencies that nobody can keep up. So um, they need cash. And you might say, but they get a lot of cash. Africa's primary exports are oil, Gas, diamonds, <coughs> platinum, you know, they're really God's treasure chest. Where's all that money going? Why would Nigeria have NEPAD not providing energy in a country that is one of the biggest exporters of energy to the United States? Any guesses where all the foreign exchange goes? Swiss bank accounts is a very good guess. It's stolen, period, and we know it. Everybody knows it, um, and what can we do about it? I think we have a responsibility to address this. This is on the level now of the United States. These corrupt dictators are not our good friends, even if they let us base our military forces there, as in Ethiopia or Uganda. They are not our friends because they're not promoting the development of their people. They're stealing the money. This is a bipartisan problem. It goes back to FDR and his deal with Saudi Arabia in the 30s, so let's not point the finger at any political party. We should not be having good relations with countries that are stealing the resources that the people need. What about corporations? Well, certainly it can't be our strategy never to invest in a country where we know some theft is going on. I think that's unrealistic. We never invest anywhere. However, um, there are some countries that we shouldn't be in. When you're really off the charts, like Idi Amin in Uganda, or Mobutu in Congo, or our good friend Mr. Obiang in Equatorial Guinea, yes, I think we should have sanctions, and the United States does. We don't trade with Sudan now because of the genocidal behavior of that government. But what about the ones that are certainly elected? Nigeria, Uganda, Angola. Angola is our biggest provider of oil today, but we know they're stealing the money. Well, this is a difficult case. Um, you ever heard of the Publish What You Pay movement? Extractive Industries Transparency Initiative requires all industries that invest in a foreign country to publish the monies they gave the government as revenues royalties. That at least allows civil society in those countries to challenge, where's the money going? I strongly support that um, it's not enough. I think we need to work a lot more on this um, uh, before we can say we're helping Africa's development by taking their natural resources and just giving the cash to the government. My two dilemmas meet in the famous um, 
case of divestment from fossil fuels, which is being promoted on most campuses. Um, because I was a leader, and I won't say leader, I'll take it back. I was a little staff member <laughs> in the Congress working on uh, the Anti-Apartheid Act, trying to help with um, turning South Africa into the multiracial democracy it is today. I supported uh, divestment of fossil fuel stocks as a way to put pressure on South Africa. But I will note this. We were asked in the United States by the South African black population and its leaders, the African National Congress, to do this. They wanted to be damaged, so the economy became ungovernable and they'd have to turn the, the country over to the Democratic majority. This was asked for. It wasn't something we came up with on our own. And not every country in the world wants to see us, uh, in order to harm their government and push them out of power, ruin their economy. So we shouldn't be doing that, it seems to me, um, for all the Africans deciding for them that uh, fossil fuels should be driven down, or their stocks should be ruined. Uh, that's not our business, really. And I've never seen an African who wanted to have less energy and less electricity uh, than more. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, our second speaker, microphone. <laughs> our second speaker, thank you, is Dr. Calvin Beisner. Uh, Dr. Beisner is a scholar on the application of Christian worldview, theology, and ethics to economics, government, environmental stewardship, and public policy. He's the national spokesman for the Cornwall Alliance for the Stewardship of Creation. He was a professor of interdisciplinary studies at Covenant College and of historical theology and social ethics at Knox Theological Seminary. He's taught theology apologetics, ethics, church history, economics, and other disciplines. He's written 12 books, made contributions to over 30 others, as well as writing um, many other articles. He's been an expert witness on ethics and economics of climate policy before congressional committees. He's also the, runs the organization that produced all the little videos that are before all of our sessions, those two or three minute, those those come from Cal. So please welcome Dr. Calvin Beisner. Thank you, Doug. Last night I uh, printed out my talk and promptly left it on the desk. <laughs> so I'll have to be talking from a screen this morning. I'll ask your forgiveness about that. One quick biographical note, autobiographical note for you before I begin uh, with with the body of my talk. When I was just a toddler, my family moved to Calcutta, India. My father was with the State Department. And a few months after we got there, my mother contracted a virus that paralyzed her. And as a little toddler, I was too little to be away in school, as two of my older sisters were. And so early each morning, my ayah, or nurse, would come to our apartment and take me by the hand and we would go down through the, uh, the courtyard where I would see a beautiful huge tree with a red flowering vine hanging from it. And from that, I eventually, over years, looking back on that as one of my earliest memories as a child, appreciated the beauty of God's creation. Then we would walk out of the courtyard and we would walk down, I don't know just how far it was, but it was a number of blocks. Uh, to the home of an Indian family where I would stay for the day. And we were out early enough in the morning that along those blocks, I would step over the bodies of scores and scores of people who had died overnight of poverty, starvation, and disease. And from that, the most powerful picture memories in my early childhood, I learned the horrors of poverty. And that's a major part of why I'm involved in the work that I am. Now, I have a very simple point for you today, that because human material well-being depends heavily on access to abundant, affordable, reliable energy, and because fossil fuels are, and for the foreseeable future, will continue to be our best source of such energy, the demand to reduce our use of fossil fuels, to reduce our CO2 emissions, to reduce man-made global warming amounts to a demand to reduce human material well-being. 
I'm going to illustrate that with a number of slides demonstrating the relationship between hydrocarbon fuel use and three measures of human well-being, infant and child mortality, human life expectancy, and income per capita. This first slide graphs CO2 emissions per person against child mortality in 1940. Each circle represents a country, the sizes indicating relative population, and the colors representing GDP per capita by nation. Yellow being high, green upper middle, red lower middle, blue low, and colorless not categorized. The higher a circle falls on the scale, the higher the per capita emissions of CO2. The farther to the right a circle falls, the higher the child mortality rate. In 1940, for the vast majority of the world's people, CO2 emissions clustered under one half ton per capita, and child mortality rates clustered between 200 and 400 deaths by age five per 1,000 born. Higher emissions, lower child mortality rates, and higher income levels clearly correlate. 69 years later, the circles have shifted to the left, showing declining child mortality rates. They have also shifted upward, showing rising CO2 emissions. In 2009, for the vast majority of the world's people, CO2 emissions cluster between 2 and 10 tons per capita. That's 4 to 40 times 1940 levels. And child mortality rates cluster between 20 and 60 deaths by age 5 per thousand born, about one-third to one-twentieth the 1940 rates. Higher emissions, lower child mortality rates, and higher incomes levels, again, clearly correlate. Now, we'll compare 1940 and 2009 measures of human life expectancy. Here, the circle's horizontal location represents life expectancy. In 1940, for the vast majority of the world's people, CO2 emissions, we remember, cluster under half a ton per capita, and life expectancy at birth clusters between 25 and 40 years. In 2009, for the vast majority of the world's people, CO2 emissions cluster between 2 and 10 tons per capita, and life expectancy clusters between 65 and 75 years about 60 to 300% higher than in 1940. Higher emissions, higher life expectancy, and higher income levels clearly correlate. Now this next slide graphs GDP per capita on the vertical scale as a function of hydrocarbon fuel use on the horizontal scale from 1800 to 2010. If we value human material well-being, we want to see GDP per capita rising and it does so only as hydrocarbon fuel use also rises. The call to reduce our use of carbon-based fuels is by implication a call to reduce our wealth. As of 2010, world GDP per capita was approaching $9,000, about a fifth what it was in the United States at the time. To return to the 1990 level of hydrocarbon fuel use would be to cut world GDP per capita by about two-fifths of that. And to return to the 1970 level would be to cut it by about two-thirds. As we see in this sixth slide, according to the IPCC's coupled climate and economic modeling, the world's poorer nations measured by poor per capita income become richest at the end of this century and the next under the warmest scenario. Now, why does that happen? because the climate models derive the magnitude of warming from the amount of economic growth, and they safely assume that the economic growth to be, is, is to be driven primarily by fossil fuel use. The lower the fossil fuel use, that is, the more successful the efforts to mitigate warming by reducing CO2 emissions, the lower the economic growth, and vice versa, the higher the fossil fuel use, the higher the economic growth. In other words, even according to the IPCC's own modeling, <clears throat> uh, assuming, the, uh, assuming high climate sensitivity, which is how much warming comes from added CO2, even through, though empirical observation increasingly points to low climate sensitivity, 
Fighting global warming does more harm than good as measured by income per capita. Now, why is that important? Because of this simple insight. The wealthier you are, the more different climates in which you can thrive and the better able you are to survive severe weather. And the corollary to that is that the poorer you are, the less able you are to thrive in any climate or to survive any extreme weather event. If your income is even equivalent to today's lower middle class in America, you can thrive in any climate from the Arctic Circle to the Sahara Desert or the Brazilian rainforest. If you're poor, you can't thrive in the most idyllic tropical paradise. Well, these insights yield this implication. Since abundant, affordable, reliable energy promotes wealth, and nuclear and fossil fuels are now, and for the foreseeable future, will be our best sources of said energy, those sources enhance human thriving and survival, and human thriving and survival are reduced proportionate to the reduction in humans' use of them. As my friend John Christie, a climatologist at the University of Alabama and a former missionary in Kenya, explains, the primitive energy system dominating uh, uh, most of the world's poorest 1.3 billion or so people works this way. The average sub-Saharan African woman spends six to eight hours a day gathering wood and dung as her primary cooking and heating fuels, leaving her precious little time uh, to, and bodily energy for other productive activities to lift herself and her children out of poverty. Smoke from that kills about four million a year, mostly women and children, and debilitates hundreds of millions for varying periods and at varying degrees because it causes upper respiratory diseases and eye infections. The poor of this world desperately need to, uh, to replace that primitive energy system with the modern one in which coal, natural gas, excuse me, I went one too far here. No, I didn't. There we go. In which coal, natural gas, and uh, nuclear materials are used to generate clean electricity delivered at scale, on demand, without interruption, through grids, not only for cooking and heating, but also for light and refrigeration, and automated clothes washing and drying and computing and industry and business and commerce and healthcare. Now, some people will respond to all of this by saying, I understand that energy is important to lifting and keeping people out of poverty, but why does it have to be fossil fuel energy? Why not power our grids with wind and solar and biofuels to minimize global warming? The answer is cost. It is less expensive to generate the vast amount of steady, on-demand, uninterrupted electricity from fossil fuels than from wind and solar. Now, don't be deceived. While the estimated cost of new electric generating technology for onshore wind is lower than for coal on a straight per megawatt hour basis, there's a tremendous difference. Electricity generated from coal is dispatchable. That is, it is instantly available and not vulnerable to the inter intermittency of wind, sunlight, and river flow. Electricity generated from wind is non-dispatchable. That is, it's subject to intermittency and requiring instantaneous backup by dispatchable technologies. As the Institute for Energy Research explains, the more that no non-dispatchable power is used, the more the electrical system requires investments in dispatchable generation forms to back up its increased use. Government policies that promote the use of non-dispatchable power are equivalent to requiring consumers to buy and care for two vehicles. One that works when you need it, and another that works when it feels like it. And the hidden costs of non-dispatchable power are substantial and should not be overlooked as part of the public policy discussion. The campaign to fight global warming by reducing fossil fuel use is at bottom a campaign to retain the primitive energy system and its accompanying low incomes and high rates of disease and premature death. It is in fact a campaign of anti-humanism. It follows that such a campaign and such a policy should be taken only if its benefits clearly exceed its costs and that can only be true if the amount of warming caused by our CO2 emissions is very high indeed. Others at this conference have already argued cogently that that is not so. So I would encourage you to get involved 
uh, in a number of different ways. You can sign our petition for Get Climate Change, Energy Empowers the Poor, which is online. Uh, you can view our YouTube series, Greener on the Other Side, uh, cl Climate Alarmism, Facts, Not Fear, some of which you're seeing here, as a matter of fact. Uh, you can get our new video documentary, Where the Grass is Greener, Biblical uh, Stewardship versus uh, Climate Alarmism. And you can also sign our open letter on climate change to the American people and send copies to your congressmen, senators, governors, state legislators, and the president. We also have an e-newsletter and we have a page on Facebook as well. There are some sheets that I've asked to be handed out at the end of this session as you all are on your way out uh, that for one, one of the sheets has that open letter on it and that includes the URL where you can go to, uh, to sign that online. You'd be joining at, at this point a little over 400 scholars and uh, other leaders who have signed that. And the other one just gives you basic information about these resources that the Cornwall Alliance for the Stewardship of Creation has. Thank you very much. Our third uh, speaker on the panel is Horace Cooper. Horace is a writer and legal commentator. He's appeared on CNN, MSNBC, Fox News, as well as in a variety of print publications. He's the co-chair of Project 21, a research fellow with the National Center for Public Policy Research, and a senior fellow with the Heartland Institute. He's been a visiting uh, assistant professor of law at George Mason University School of Law. He, is, he served in a number of senior capacities in the George W. Bush administration, including stints as chief of staff for the Voice of America and the Department of Labor's uh, Employment Standards Administration. Uh, Horace Cooper previously served as counsel to Majority Leader Dick Armey. Yes, he is from Texas. He is a graduate of the University of Texas, and he is from, <laughs> from Point Blank, Texas. Horace, please welcome Horace Cooper. Thank you so much for that kind introduction and uh, Doug called me and told me that uh, you guys were going to be holding a conference and I'd get a chance to come to Texas, but then I realized I was going to come to Austin. Now, I am a Longhorn, I'm proud of my time there, but like a visitor to a foreign land, it was an opportunity for me to really learn a lot about what I believe and who I am. And in keeping with that, uh, I think that's why it's really, really interesting and informative that we're having a conversation today about uh, American energy policy. You know, I was born in the state of Texas. I think of myself largely in terms of my Texas background. I also think of myself as an American, and I'm so proud and thankful to live in a great country where people came together and created an amazing concept, what we call the United States Constitution. And I celebrate the notion that we are a representative republic. Now, I say all of that to say it disheartens me a great deal when I observe things that challenge the very essence of who we are. This nation has on its own terms and on the world's terms, created more hope, more opportunity, more freedom, and yes, more prosperity than any other country on the globe. That's right. We should be proud and celebrating that achievement, not apologizing and running away from it. And in this particular way, with the, excuse me, the White House's policy on energy, we are undermining our greatest talent and ability. We are undermining our ability to provide not just for ourselves, but to set a model that will help others. And why I mention my American citizenship, it's largely being done in a way that is inconsistent with a representative democracy. We came to this country not for one-man rule. 
we came to this country so that the citizen would get to decide public policy. And it is, it is remarkably destructive to watch the decline that's happening in America, particularly in this area of energy, and know that the American people, when they are objecting, aren't getting a chance to have their say. We see a plan put forward that is going to, on its face, save lives in the future of people that we don't know will actually be harmed. But what we will see are injuries and harms that are going to happen today. The president and the White House and the policies behind this destructive energy plan opposes oil and gas, opposes our opportunities to exploit the talents and skills that lead to nuclear energy. And even when great allies in the North, like Canada, offer up us an opportunity with the Keystone Pipeline the policy answer is no. This isn't good for America. In fact, what we're doing is we're shifting away our economy from a vibrant, thriving economy that's based on fossil fuels and carbon, and it is going to be destructive. And by the way, the economy over the last seven years has been nothing to brag about. This plan not only isn't going to help with that lingering economic problem that faces our country, it's going to hurt minority families and the poor most. The plan itself essentially ignores basic economic principles. And by doing so, it is cruel in its impact. It is caustic in how harmful that it is going to be. And by the way, when you talk about hurting poor people who are least able to defend themselves from it, we have to ask ourselves, look in the mirror as a nation. Is this the model of what we want to be? The rising energy costs that are going to happen, and they are already underway, the president himself, when he campaigned, told us under his plan necessarily these costs would skyrocket. Poor people are the least able. Now mind you, there is no one that goes out to Macy's or even Walmart and they say when they pick up an item, well the price on this thing is too low. I'd like to have a little more, please. No one says that. We're all interested in looking at a bargain. But you know the difference between people who can bargain and people who don't have a say? The poor among us often are those that are left without a choice. Households that make less than $50,000 a year spend as much as 20% of that income on energy. You're saying one-fifth of what they're going to spend is now going to increase. Now, good moms and dads, good families, they like to do the basics first. Everybody would love to go out on Friday night. I like to go to Ruth's Chris whenever I can. You can look at me and tell. But good families, they look at the budget and they understand. I'm not going to be able to afford those kind of things. I want to make sure Johnny gets the shoes. I want to make sure that Sally gets all of the tools necessary so she can compete in junior high and high school. And when she gets ready to go off to school, to college, we can be so proud of her. Well, if 20% is already locked out, what are they going to do when it's 22, 24, 25, 30% of their budget? This is real life. 67% of black households, when this data was taken in 2009 and 10, had incomes under $50,000. Now, that means loads of people who are minority 
are going to be hurt when these prices go up. 62% of Hispanic households in 2009 and 10 had incomes of less than 50%. Now, if you were looking at this energy plan and didn't have any other data, I think you'd be of a mind that America must be in the biggest boom possible. Remember Marie Antoinette on the eve of the revolution? Apparently she got a little ahead of herself, ahead of herself. Uh, people were outside complaining because they were hungry. And what did she say? History reports are saying, let them eat cake. Well, because, well, if you don't have bread, you don't have soup, you must have eaten all of that, but you surely haven't gotten through all of the desserts. That's how far removed from reality she was. And if you look at this plan, that's how far removed it is. It is operating as if the average American is not making uh, five-figure incomes, but the average America, uh, American isn't even making six-figure incomes. The average American must be making seven-figure incomes. They can supplement their energy source with all manner of backups that they can triage on a regular basis. And they don't just have one Tesla, they've got five Tesla Teslas. You can charge two while mom's driving one, son's driving the other, you're driving the other. This is the kind of mindset that one would have to believe is in play for this plan to be presented. Now, I don't have to tell you that that's not the reality that America is facing right now, but I'm going to. Unemployment in America today has a labor force participation rate that is the lowest in 38 years. If you want to create jobs, raising energy costs is not the way to do that. The average hourly wages this year are showing the same thing they showed last year and the same thing they showed the year before and the year before and the year before. They are either static or they are declining. Meanwhile, the cost of items continue to rise. Gallup has been doing for 70 years an economic monthly survey asking people how they are doing. And the confidence survey says 58 percent of Americans last month said the economy is getting worse. That was 15,000 people they ask every month this question. 58% of them say the economy is getting worse. Exports, the export growth rate is down to levels not seen since the last official recession of 2008. Market analysts say that manufacturing is officially in a recession. Now let me tell you what's going on with Black America. Black America was asked by my organization, the National Center for Public Policy Research, a survey about climate change, about carbon emissions, and the importance and priorities. 76% of Blacks said in our survey, the priority needs to be economic growth. That's the top priority, even if it means we do nothing on climate change. 2% of blacks said that if you adopt these changes, white Americans are going to be the hardest hit. 2%. 40% said black Americans are going to be the hardest hit. 52% of black Americans, when asked, said they wouldn't want to spend a nickel on higher gas prices or electricity prices. The president's plan ignores basic economic principles and it confronts constituencies in a way that rejects their interests and their needs. As a percentage of after-tax income, black Americans shoulder a 51% higher burden when it comes to energy costs for their household than the rest of America. The National Black Chamber of Commerce looked at these rules 
and said that black and Hispanic poverty would increase by 23% and 26% respectively. You want to talk about actual impact? Their study also said the losses in the black community would reach 7 million jobs lost by 2035 and 12 million jobs lost for Hispanic Americans over that same period of time. Black Americans and Hispanic Americans often, because of their income, face a higher burden in dealing with energy costs than the rest of the country. Now, mind you, as I explained, the rest of the country isn't in some holiday in the park having a wonderful time. It is a bad, bad strategy to embark on these kinds of policies when it isn't good for America, it's not even good for the economy, and it's not good for the globe. And in particular, it's not good for minorities. Energy prices are affecting all of the economy. It will lead to a delay in the growth and return of growth in our economy overall. The president's plans, this decision to cripple America's economy at this time is a terrible one. It hurts so many people, and it, it really defies the idea that we are a representative government. We absolutely ought to have a say in this. Black America, white America, all of America. And the answer is, this is not the right plan today. Thank you. So we, uh, we have a couple of minutes for, uh, for questions. And I'd like to open it up to folks in the audience who might have a question about uh, poverty, energy poverty, uh, how we can convince lower and middle income folks to be with us on these issues. So, question. Somebody, besides why is it so hot in here? Yes, sir. And this one. We'll have our speaker here. I was going to ask more about the parallel between the DDT uh, issue in, in Africa versus the uh, war on power. Yeah, unfortunately, Dr. Rossiter had to leave to catch a plane. So, uh, Cal, Pal, yeah, Cal, do you have any thoughts about that? I can address it a bit. Um, of course, the, the uh, essential banning of DDT, even if not a legal banning of DDT, uh, has contributed to probably about, uh, well, starting off over about the first 35 years of that policy, about 2 million uh, excess malaria deaths per year, uh, mostly in Africa. It's come down now to perhaps about a million a year instead. Uh, but nonetheless, that's pretty awful. The reason for that, of course, is uh, Western elite environmentalists who, uh, who have their particular notions about what DDT does to the, uh, to the environment, and particularly to, to birds high on the uh, bird food chain. Um, notions that are, at best, pretty exaggerated, um, but who really, uh, have not thought an awful lot, a lot about human lives. When we think in terms of the, the anti-human attitude that dominates much of the world's largest environmental advocacy organizations, and I don't mean by that most of the rank and file members who send in their 10 or $20 a month or something to support, but the, uh, the top leaders of organizations like this are on record over and over saying that essentially the Earth's carrying capacity for human beings is perhaps half a billion people, meaning we've got to get rid of about 95, 97% of us. There's the 97% consensus, by the way. Um, and when that's the case, if your policy results in shortened lifespan, lifespans for a bunch of people somewhere, that's okay. It's a small price to pay to preserve Mother Earth. Yes, get a mic over here, please. time these come up for a vote, 
they're not able to pass these draconian policies in Congress. And you have to answer questions to your constituents when you do. And that's one of the reasons why the executive order routine has been pursued. Um, why? Uh, this is about legacy building. Um, this is about a commitment to a vision greater than what the facts bear out. And this is about uh, what my old boss would have called the triumph of hope over experience when referencing someone's third divorce. Um, <laughs> my old boss was Dick Army. Um, uh, these are dangerous approaches. And our founders had hoped to create a situation where even if someone with those kinds of views came forward, our system would work appropriately to mitigate against them. And so um, much of what we're seeing couldn't even happen if we were operating under uh, the, the system that our founders had contemplated. So I have a question. Um, recently, the Pope came to Washington, came to, to the United States. Uh, he seemed to carry a message of, uh, that we needed to do certain things to help the climate. And uh, I'm just curious your thoughts in terms of uh, how that syncs with his view on poverty. Well, my own view is there's nothing bad about individuals taking um, changes in their own lives voluntarily. Helping out or sacrificing or even, you know, switching back a little bit from the changes like I might need to do occasionally. Those things are fine. The problem is when you force people and you're making them make choices. And I think the Pope and others who talk about these issues would be well considered to think about people on fixed incomes. A large percentage of their resources are pharmaceuticals and medicines that they use to treat themselves. We're asking people with this kind of a policy to pick. Are you going to have the electricity or are you going to have the pills that continue to help out with blood circulation? I, I'm not sure that those things are being thought through. Cal, do you have anything to add there? Well, um, last spring, uh, just before the encyclical came, uh, came out, the Cornwall Alliance uh, put out a, an open letter to Pope Francis on climate change, which is still online, uh, climateletter to popefrancis.org. And we pointed out that there, there's really a, a very sad irony. Uh, Pope Francis, uh, I think, undoubtedly has a tremendous uh, compassion and, and care for the poor around the world. But the irony is that he's promoting policies related to climate and energy that, that will uh, trap the world's poorest in their poverty for generations to come. And I think, you know, this is, uh, you know, there are all sorts of reasons why this is so. Uh, but one thing I think for a lot of our Catholic friends to remember is that uh, the Catholic dogma does not teach that the papacy has any authority whatsoever on issues of, of economics, public policy, that sort of thing. Papal authority extends in Catholic thought to, uh, to theology and, and moral principles, not even to the particular application of moral principles, which often de depends on specific knowledge of very important empirical circumstances. Uh, the Pope's understanding of economics is largely driven by the liberation theology that he was uh, promoting very heavily uh, throughout his period as a priest and then as a bishop. And this liberation theology basically sees capitalism, sees free trade as an evil, and sees socialism as the solution to that. And I think probably why Pope Francis has uh, climbed onto the climate bandwagon uh, is far more because he recognizes that that is the current rationale for wealth redistribution around the world than because he or any of his Vatican advisors were really convinced by any of the scientific evidence that, that climate change, anthropogenic climate change, posed a greater risk to the poor around the world than their poverty. Uh, I, d I don't think there's any indication that there was significant understanding of that. If you read Laudato Si, the papal encyclical on environment, one of the things that fascinated me as a theologian is that all the way through this, this lengthy document, there are lots and lots of, of references to his sources of the information that he's putting across, except in the four paragraphs that deal with climate change. There isn't a single reference in there. There are just statements that might as well have been cribbed from 
from PR statements out of Greenpeace or, or <laughs> other such groups. No real understanding of the science behind it at all. Well, uh, I want to thank my panelists and uh, appreciate everybody in, uh, with the questions. Uh, uh, we're going to take a 15-minute break. Um, and come back here at 445 for a panel on politics and economics. So help yourself for 15 minutes.